Hello, and welcome to The Lightning Thief by Rick Rodin. Chapter 1. I accidentally vaporized my pre-algebra teacher. Look, I didn't want to be a half-blood. If you're reading this because you think you might be one, my advice is close this book right now. Believe whatever lie your mom or dad told you about your birth and try to lead a normal life. Being a half-blood is dangerous. It's scary. Most of the time, it gets you killed in painful, nasty ways. If you're a normal kid reading this because you think it's fiction, great. Read on. I envy you for being able to believe that none of this ever happened. But if you recognize yourself in these pages, if you feel something stirring inside... Stop reading immediately. You might be one of us. And you know... And once you know that, it's only a matter of time before they sense it too. They'll come for you. Don't say, I didn't warn you. My name is Percy Jackson. I'm 12 years old. Until a few months ago, I was a boarding student at Yancey Academy, a private school for troubled kids in upstate New York. Am I a troubled kid? Yeah, you could say that. I could start at any point in my short, miserable life to prove it, but things only started going bad last May, when our sixth grade class took a field trip to Manhattan, 28 metal case kids and two teachers on a yellow school bus, Sorry. on a yellow school bus heading to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to look at ancient Greek and Roman stuff. I know it sounds like torture, most Yancey field trips were, but Mr. Brunner, our Latin teacher, was leading this trip, so I had hopes. Mr. Brunner was this middle-aged guy in a motorized wheelchair. He had thinning hair and a scruffy beard and a frayed tweed jacket, which always smelled like coffee. You wouldn't think he'd be cool but he told stories and jokes and let us play games in class. He also had this awesome collection of Roman armor and weapons, so he was the only teacher whose class didn't put me to sleep. I hoped the trip would be okay. At least I hoped that for once I wouldn't get in trouble. Boy, was I wrong. See, bad things happen to me on field trips. Like my fifth grade school, when we were at the Saratoga battlefield, I, I had this accident with a Revolutionary War cannon. I wasn't aiming for the school bus, of course, but I got expelled anyway. And before that, at my fourth grade school, when we took a behind-the-scenes tour of the Marine World Shark Pool, I sort of hit the wrong lever on the catwalk, and our class took an unplanned swim. And the time before that, well, you get the idea. This trip, I was determined to be good. All the way into the city, I put up with Nancy Boba Finn, the freckly, red-headed, kleptomaniac girl, hitting my best friend Grover in the back of the head with chunks of peanut butter and ketchup sandwich. Grover was an easy target. He was scrawny. He cried when he got frustrated. He must have been held back several grades, because he was the only sixth grader with acne and the start of a wispy beard on his chin. On top of all that, he was crippled. He had a note excusing him from P.E. for the rest of his life because he had some kind of muscular disease in his legs. He walked funny, like every step hurt him. But don't let that fool you. You should have seen him run when it was enchilada day in the cafeteria. Anyway, Nancy Boba Fett was throwing wads of sandwich that stuck into his curly brown hair, and I knew... And she knew I couldn't do anything back to her. I was already on probation. The headmaster threatened me with death by in-school suspension. If anything bad, embarrassing, or even mildly entertaining happened on this trip. I'm going to kill her, I mumbled. Grover tried to calm me down. It's okay, I like peanut butter. He dodged another piece of Nancy's lunch. That's it. I started to get up, but Grover pulled me back into my seat. You're already on probation, he reminded me. You know who'll get blamed if anything happens. Looking back on it, I wish I'd decked Nancy Boba Fett right then and there. In-school suspension would have been nothing compared to the mess I was about to get myself into. Mr. Brunner led the museum tour. 
He rode uh, up front in his wheelchair, guiding us through the big echoey galleries past marble statues and glass cases full of really old black and orange pottery. It blew my mind that this stuff had survived for 2,000, 3,000 years. He gathered us around a 13-foot-tall stone column with a big sphinx on top and started talking, started telling us it was a grave marker or a steel for a girl about our age. He told us about the carvings on the sides. I was trying to listen to what he had to say because it was kind of interesting, but everybody around me was talking, and every time I told him to shut up, the other teacher's chaperone, Miss Dodds, would give me the evil eye. Miss Dodds was this little math teacher from Georgia who always wore a black leather jacket, even though she was like 50 years old. She looked mean enough to ride a Harley right into your locker. She had come to Yancey halfway through the year when our last math teacher had a nervous breakdown. From her first day, Nancy, Miss Dodds loved Nancy Boba Fett, and I figured I and figured I was devil spawn. She would point her crooked finger at me and say, "Now, honey, real sweet," and I knew I was going to get after-school detention for a month. One time, after she'd made me erase answers out of old math workbooks until midnight. I told Grover I didn't think Miss Dodds was human. He looked at me real serious and said, You're absolutely right. Mr. Brunner kept talking about Greek funeral art. Finally, Nancy Bobovet snickered something about the naked guy on the steel, and I turned around and said, Will you shut up? It came out louder than I meant it to. The whole group laughed, and Mr. Brunner stopped the story. Mr. Jackson, do you have a comment? His face, my face was totally red. I said, no, sir. Mr. Brunner pointed to one of the pictures on the steel. Perhaps you'll tell us what this picture represents? I looked at the carving and felt a flush of relief. I actually recognized it. That's Kronos eating his kids, right? Yes, Mr. Brunner said, obviously not satisfied. And he did this because, well, I racked my brain to remember. Kronos was the king god, and... God, Mr. Brunner asked. Titan, I corrected myself, and... He didn't trust his kids who were the gods, so, uh... Kronos ate them, right? But his wife hid baby Zeus, and Cro gave Kronos a uh, rock to eat instead. And later, when Zeus grew up, he tricked his dad, Kronos, into barfing up his brothers and sisters. Ew, said one of the girls behind me. And so was there and so there was this big fight between the gods and titans, I continued, and the gods won. Some snickers from the group behind me, Nancy Boba Fett mumbled to a friend. Like we're going to use this in real life. Like it's going to say on our job application, please explain why Kronos ate his kids. And why, Mr. Jackson? Brunner said. To paraphrase Miss Boba Fett's in excellent question, does this matter in real life? Busted, Grover mumbled. Shut up, Nancy hissed, her face even brighter red than her hair. At least Nancy got packed too. Mr. Brunner was the only one who ever caught her saying anything wrong. He had radar ears. I thought about his question and shrugged. I don't know, sir. I see, Mr. Brunner looked disappointed. Well, half credit, Mr. Jackson. Zeus did indeed fi feed Cronus a mixture of mustard and wine, which made him disgorge his other five children, who, of course, being immortal gods, have been living and growing up completely undigested in the Titan's stomach. The gods defeated their father, sliced him to pieces with his own scythe, and scattered his remains in Tartarus, the darkest pit of the underworld. On that happy note, it's time for lunch. Miss Dodds, would you lead us back outside? The class drifted off, the girls holding their stomachs and the guys pushing each other around and acting like doofuses. Grover and I were about to follow when Mr. Brunner said, Mr. Jackson? I knew it was coming. I told Grover to keep going, then turned around to Mr. Brunner and said, Sir? Mr. Brunner had this look that wouldn't let you go. Intense brown eyes that could have been a thousand years old and had seen everything. 
You must learn the answer to my question, Mr. Brunner told me, about the Titans, about real life, and how your studies apply to it. Oh. What you learn from me, he said, is vitally important. I expect you to treat it as such. I will accept only the best from you, Percy Jackson. I wanted to get angry. This guy pushed me so hard. I mean, sure, it was kind of cool on tournament days when he dressed up in a suit of Roman armor and shouted, What ho! and challenged a sword point against Chark to run to the board and name every Greek and Roman person who ever lived, and their mother. And what god they worship, but Mr. Brunner expected me to be as good as everybody else, despite the fact that I have dyslexia and attention deficit disorder, and I had never made above a C in my life. No, he didn't expect me to be as good. He expected me to be better. And I couldn't learn all those names and facts, much less spell them correctly. I mumbled something about trying harder while Mr. Brunner took one long look at this well, took one long, sad look at the steel like he'd been at this girl's funeral. He told me to go outside and eat my lunch. The class gathered on the front steps of the museum where we watched the foot of the traffic along Fifth Avenue. Overhead, a huge storm was brewing with clouds blacker than I had seen over the city. I figured maybe it was global warming or something because the weather all across New York State had been weird since Christmas. We'd had massive snowstorms, flooding, wildfires from lightning strikes. I wouldn't have been surprised if it, if it, if this was a hurricane blowing in. Nobody else seemed to notice. Some of the guys were pelting pigeons with lunchable crackers. Nancy Boba Fett was pickpocketing something from a lady's purse. And, of course, Miss Dodds wasn't seeing a thing. Grover and I sat on the edge of the fountain, away from the others. We thought that maybe if we did that, everybody wouldn't know we were from that school. The school for loser freaks who couldn't make it anywhere else. Detention? Grover asked. Nah, I said. Not from Brunner. I just wish he'd lay off me sometimes. I mean, I'm not a genius. Grover didn't say anything for a while. Then, when I thought he was going to give me some deep philosophical comment to make me feel better, he said, Can I have your apple? I didn't have much of, much of an appetite, so I let him take it. I watched a stream of cabs go down, going down Fifth Avenue and thought about my mom's apartment, only a little ways away uptown from where we sat. I hadn't seen her since Christmas. I wanted so bad to jump in a taxi and head home. She'd hug me and be glad to see me, but she'd be disappointed too. She'd send me right back to Yancey, remind me that I had to try harder even if this was my sixth school in six years. I was probably going to be kicked out again. I wouldn't be able to stand the sad look she'd give me. Mr. Brunner parked his wheelchair at the base of the handicap ramp. He ate celery while he read a paperback novel. A red umbrella stuck up from the back of his chair, making it look like a motorized cafe table. I was about to unwrap my sandwich when Nancy Boba Fett appeared in front of me with her ugly friends. I guess she'd gotten tired of stealing from tourists and dumped her half-eaten sandwich in half-eaten lunch in Grover's lap. Oops! She grinned at me with her crooked teeth. Her freckles were orange as if someone had spray-painted her face with liquid Cheeto. I tried to stay cool. The school counselor had told me a million times, Count to ten. Get a control of your temper. But I was so mad my mind went blank. A wave roared in my ears. I don't remember touching her, but the next thing I knew, Nancy was sitting on her butt in the fountain, screaming, Percy pushed me! Miss Dodds materialized next to us. Some kids were whispering, Did you see? The water. Like it grabbed her. I didn't know what they were talking about, but all I knew was that I was in trouble again. As soon as Miss Dodds was sure poor little Nancy was okay, promising to get her a new t-shirt at the museum gift shop, etc., etc., Miss Dodds turned on me. There was a triumphant fire in her eyes, as if I'd done something she'd been waiting for all semester. Now, honey, I know I grumbled a month erasing workbooks. That wasn't the right thing to say. Come with me, Miss Dodds said. Wait, Grover yelled. Uh, it was me. I pushed her. I stared at him, stunned. I couldn't believe he was trying to cover for me. 
Miss Dodd scared Grover to death. She glared at him so hard his whiskery chin trembled. I don't think so, Mr. Underwood, she said, but you will stay here. Grover looked at me desperately. It's okay, man, I told him. Thanks for trying. Honey, Miss Dodds barked at me. Now, Nancy Boba Fett smirked. I gave her my deluxe, I'll kill you later stare when I turned to face Miss Dodds, but she wasn't there. She was standing at the museum entrance, way at the top, gesturing impatiently at me to come. How'd she get there so fast? I was... I have moments like that a lot, when my brain falls asleep or something, and the next thing I know, I've missed something. As if puzzle pieces fell out of the universe and left me staring at a blank... at the blank place behind it. The school counselor told me this is part of my ADHD, my brain misinterpreting things. I wasn't so sure. I went after Miss Dodds. Halfway up the steps, I glanced at Grover. He was looking pale, cutting his, brow his eyes between me and Mr. Brunner. Like he wanted Mr. Brunner to notice what was going on, but Mr. Brunner was absorbed in his novel. I looked back up. Miss Dodds had disappeared again. She was now inside the building, at the end of the entrance hall. Okay, I thought. She's going to make me buy a new t-shirt for Nancy of the gift shop. But apparently, that wasn't the plan. I followed her deeper into the museum. When I finally caught up to her, we were back at the Greek and Roman section. Except for the gallery. Except for us. The gallery was empty. Miss Dodd stood with her arms crossed in front of the big marble frieze of the Greek gods, she was making this weird noise in her throat, like growling. Even without the noise, I would have been nervous. It's weird being alone with a teacher, especially Miss Dodds. Something about the way she looked at the freeze, as if she wanted to pulverize it. You've been giving us a lot of problems, honey, she said. I did the safe thing and said, yes, ma'am. She tugged on the cuff of her leather jacket. Did you really think you would get away with it? The look in her eyes was beyond mad. It was evil. She's a teacher, I thought nervously. It's not like she's going to hurt me. I said, I'll, I'll try harder, ma'am. Thunder shook the building. We are not fools, Percy Jackson, Miss Dodds said. It was only a matter of time before we found you out. Confess and you will suffer less pain. I didn't know what she was talking about. All I could think of was that the teachers must have found the illegal stash of candy I'd been selling out of my dorm room. Or maybe they'd realized I got my essay on Tom Sawyer from the internet without having read the book, and now they were going to take away my grade. Or worse, they were going to make me read the book. Well, she, well, she demanded. Ma'am, I don't... Your time is up, she hissed. The weirdest thing happened. Her eyes began to glow like barbecue coals. Her fingers stretched, turning into talons. Her jacket melted into large, leathery wings. She wasn't human. She was a shriveled hag with bat wings, claws, and a mouthful of yellow fangs. And she was about to slice me to ribbons. Then things got even stranger. Mr. Brunner, who'd been out in front of the museum a minute before, wheeled his chair into the doorway gallery of the gallery holding a pen in his hand what ho percy he shouted and tossed the pen in the air miss dodds lunged at me with a yelp i dodged and felt talons slash the air next to my ear i snatched the ballpoint pen out of the air but when it hit my hand it wasn't a pen anymore it was a sword mr brunner's bronze sword which he always used on tournament day miss dodds spun toward me with a murderous look in her eyes my knees were jelly. My hands were shaking so bad I almost dropped the sword. She snarled, Die, honey! And she flew straight at me. Absolute terror ran through my body. I did the only thing that came natural. I swung the sword. The metal blade hit her shoulder and passed clean through her body, as if she were made of water. <sighs> Miss Dodds was a sand castle in a power fan. She exploded into yellow powder. Vaporized on the spot, leaving nothing but the smell of sulfur and the dying screech of it. and a dying screech and a chill of evil in the air, as if those two glowing red eyes were still watching me. I was alone. 
There was a ballpoint pen in my hand. Mr. Brunner wasn't there. Nobody was there but me. My hand still trembling. My lunch must have been contaminated or something. Contaminated with magic mushrooms or something. Had I imagined the whole thing? I went back outside. It had started to rain. Grover was sitting by the fountain, a museum map tinted over his head. Nancy Boba Fett was still standing there, soaked from her swim in the fountain, grumbling to her ugly friends. When she saw me, she said, I hope Miss Kerr whipped your butt. I said, who? Our teacher. Duh. I blinked. We had no teacher named Miss Kerr. I asked Nancy what she was talking about. She just rolled her eyes and turned away. I asked Grover where Miss Dodds was. He said, who? But he paused first. He wouldn't look at me, and he wouldn't look at me, so I thought he was messing with me. Not funny, man, I told him. This is serious. Thunder boomed overhead. I saw Mr. Brunner sitting under his red umbrella, reading his book as if he'd never moved. I went over to him. He looked up a little distracted. Ah, that would be my pen. Please bring your own writing utensil in the future, Mr. Jackson. I handed Mr. Brunner his pen. I hadn't even realized I was still holding it. Sir, I said, where's Miss Dodds? The, sh the other chaperone, Miss Dodds, the pre-algebra teacher? He frowned and sat forward, looking mildly concerned. Percy, there is no Miss Dodds on this trip. As far as I know, there has never been a Miss Dodds at Yancey Academy. Are you feeling all right? And thus concludes chapter one of The Lightning Thief, the first book in the series of Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Uh, my thoughts on this chapter is it's a pretty good start. It starts off kind of slow, but it gradually builds up into it. And if you're reading... If you're reading as I prefer to read in my head, I don't normally read out loud, but I've been told for a while that I'm good at reading out loud, so I decided to go ahead and start recording this audiobook. Anyway, I apologize for the constantly uh, tapping the screen. I gotta do that to keep my phone on so that there's a background and that it will record the footage. Anyway, uh, Anthony, what are your thoughts on the first chapter? Yeah, I figured the first chapter was kind of slow, but... It's the beginning of the beginning of the fir it's the beginning of the first book in the series, so it obviously had to be a little slow to get some introductions out of the way, build up some stuff, and start slowly introducing you into it, which I feel he did somewhat well at easing you into the world instead of sh boom, it's there. Well, there's also the quick little line from Percy at the beginning, which is you know, you probably heard earlier on, which does kind of give away that he's a half blood early on, and I think that's kind of like you know spoilers, but. At the same time, I don't, like, I mean, at least you're just preparing us for what's about to come. Anyway, and there's no real, um, nothing really that tells you what the book's about. Well, there is that. Um, sorry, you can't see it, but. And you the part on the back of the book or on the inside of the cover that tells you everything about it. Yeah. Anyway, so. That scene in the first chapter really eases you in, and then Although just I kind of pull. A little drug reference in there. Magic mushrooms. I learned recently at school is they nickname for a certain type of drug. Can't remember what kind. Yeah, it really eases you into the world where he's in, and he kind of just explains the situation. Anyway, but yeah. So my mom told me I'm good at reading out loud when I started reading this book to her, uh, and she said she suggested that I start recording it for an audio book and put it on my YouTube channel. This isn't going to be a regular thing. I'm not going to do this too often because it takes up a lot of memory space and I'm not going to be recording multiple episodes at once, but I'm going to try and upload at least one chapter a week. I'm sorry, but that's just how things are going to have to go because I, it's been a while since I recorded and it's time that I should get started on the finale for the Pokemon series. And I want to get that up sometime uh, in the next week. I want to get that up before Halloween. Anyway, so it really eases you in, pulls the rug out from underneath you, and just kind of introduces you to Percy Jackson as a character, along with introduces you to Grover and Mr. Brunner, who will be important characters later on in the story. Also introduces characters that we will never see again. Like Nancy Boba Fett. <laughs>
I mean, outside of the first two chapters and uh, a little bit into chapter three, they don't a little bit into chapter three. Yeah, there's a brief mention later on. Yeah, he get, uh, she gets a brief mention in chapter four, and that's about it. Um, so yeah, that's it, and we are well past my normally established twenty minute time limit. That's why I didn't want to uh, record multiple episodes. Anyway. So that is the episode, and sorry about recording vertically, but reasons. So, uh, and besides, would have look like that was what I wanted to do with it. Just kind of have like the title of the lightning thief, but if I tapped it again like too many times, then it would have done that, which I did do earlier on, but just pretending that nothing happened. Anyway, so that's it, and. Uh, I'll read another chapter later on in the week and upload that. So I'll get out one chapter a week at least. Anyway, so with any luck, I'll have this done just after 2019 starts. <laughs> so that's going to, well, maybe I'll record at least two, maybe three chapters a week, but I'm not going to make this a super regular thing. Anyway, so that's all for this time, and I do have Anthony here to comment alongside me. Anyway, that's it. Probably not also be a regular occurrence, so this is a nice yeah. thing that I popped in. We're not going to be able to hang out, or we're not going to be able to hang out as often. Anyway, so that's it. Have a good day.